Good morning. Welcome to worship on this second week in Lent as we travel through the Lenten season. We began last Wednesday our series on Lent and we started with the Soup Supper, which was amazing. We continue this week again, so the Soup Supper starts at 6, and this week's theme will be on Isaiah of Babylon. Just note the announcements in the bulletin this morning. We are collecting for uh, the Neighbors of Hope. That's what that tree at the back of the Narthex is, so you can take a, a tag off of that as we support that ministry this month. Let us rise for a confession. <coughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt through your call to us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave his only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. We sing our gathering hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. O God, our leader and guide in the waters of baptism, you bring us to new birth, to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises, that by your spirit we may lift up your life to all the world, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 12. God's call of Abram and Sarai has a clear purpose, that through them all the families of the earth would gain a blessing. As they set out on their journey, they are accompanied by promises of land, nation, and a great reputation. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your king, kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curses you I will curse, and in, all, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 121, which we'll read responsively. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4. In the person and example of Abraham, we discovered that a right relationship with God does not involve earning a reward from God, but entails trusting God's promises. Abraham is the forebear and model for both Jews and Gentiles, because we too trust that ours is a God who gives life to the dead. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who is without work trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness." For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, 
for he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. gospel according to John the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses was lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord. Congregation may be seated. Can I have the children come forward? We have any out there that want to come down this morning? I see one, but she's not going to do it, is she? (laughs) So I'll give the children's sermon to the adults. So how many know what a summary is? What's a summary? Just shout it out. An overview, okay, an overview. So if I ask you to summarize this book, the Bible, (laughs) how would you summarize it? One verse, one verse. Martin Luther said the gospel in a nutshell is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. That's the summary in one verse. That's all you need to know. So if someone says, have you read the Bible? Yes, I have. (laughs) And I can summarize it for you in one verse. (laughs) That's the verse. That's the verse. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus, that you loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And we share that love and that life with the world, as you call us. In his name we pray. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the loving Christ. So this may sound a little bizarre, but the longer I stay in ministry, the less I understand about preaching. In fact, I know less about preaching today than I knew 39 years ago in seminary. Back then when I was a student, and I'm sure for Pastor Rick, who was a couple years ahead of me, We had pretty much a model for sermons. You started out with a joke, and you had three points, and you did the sermon on the scripture, and then you ended with a poem, amen, it's over. 
So why does a sermon work? How does it achieve results when all writes? It should fall on its face in our day of texting and instant messaging and five-second attention spans, which I think has slipped to about three. And why does a sermon not work when it has all the right stuff, just the right blend of all those ingredients and spirituality, and it lasts only 12 minutes? It's a mystery. On a good week, when there's been ample time to do all the research and word searches and internet surfing and preaching resources, and, and there's a lot of them, most of us homileticians feel pretty comfortable with this end product. And then Sunday comes, as it always does, and we're about six minutes into this sermon, and, and we look out at you, and we see blank expressions. That's the oh no moment for a preacher. <laughs> You know that moment when the keys are hanging in the car and you hit the button and you go, oh no, it's too late. How could I have done that? So for the preacher of today's gospel, it's like, why in the world did I choose this text to preach on? John 3.16 for crying out loud. Y'all know it. You recited it in the children's sermon. What was I thinking? And sometimes sermons backfire. They roll over and play dead or they just limp off into well-deserved obscurity. Sometimes they totally miss the mark and they fail to connect. And what's even worse, sometimes sermons do work and we don't have a clue why. Sometimes we pastors have a busy week. Meetings and visits and phone calls and emails and folks are in the hospital and then there's a newsletter to work on and a couple people will drop by just to chat and it goes for an hour or two. Not that any of those things are bad. Those are the privileges of being a pastor. It's just that you really meant to spend a little more time on that sermon. And now it's Friday and Sunday's coming. So you tell the old, old story and you use old stories. You trot out every well-worn cliche. You tie a yellow ribbon around the oak tree. He's not heavy. He's my brother. Christ has no hands but our hands. And you pray all the while that you nice folks sitting in the pew will suddenly develop temporary amnesia and forget that you've heard this so many times before. And you limp to the end of the sermon and you pray for the benediction to rescue you. And then the service is mercifully over and you're standing at the door to shake hands. And you're ready to apologize and say, well, next week will be better, I promise. And then someone grabs your hand on the way out, and their eyes are all misty, and they're having trouble getting the words out, and they manage to mumble, you don't know what those words meant to me. And his wife is right behind him, and she says, preacher, I'm going to the hospital this week for some surgery, and after that sermon, I'm ready for anything. And then you go, What did I say? That's the mysterious, amazing grace of God. For God so loved the world. Late one night, a leader of the synagogue, a man who was very learned, came to Jesus. His name was Nicodemus. And he said, Teacher, we've seen you do some pretty impressive things, like turning that ice water into Mogan David at that wedding. You ought to be careful, though. The local winemakers union is a little upset about that. Anyhow, I understand most of what you've been saying in public, but I want to know this. I want to know, how do I get into the kingdom of God? What exactly would I have to do to get what you got? Nicodemus had been listening to Jesus. But the more he thought he understood, the less He actually knew. Now you wouldn't be able to tell that from looking at him. Obviously he was a picture of confidence and self-assurance. The first words out of his mouth are, Rabbi, we know. You see what he's doing? He's kind of setting the ground rules for the conversation they're about to have. Let's have a teacher-to-teacher conversation, he's saying. It's all about control after all. Nothing is left to chance. We know... And what exactly does Nicodemus know? He thinks he knows the source of Jesus' power and the goal of his ministry. He thinks he has God all figured out and packaged into this little box. He thinks he knows about people. 
He knows that they were born to grow old and die. But this Jesus has confused him. Has caused him to wonder if he really understands everything he thinks he knows about God. Nicodemus came to Jesus that night looking for a formula. A new set of rules to add to the law keeper's already lengthy list. And the writer of the Gospel of John portrays Nicodemus as a sincere man, a devout man, a man who obeys the law. He exercises responsible citizenship. But at the level of faith, Nicodemus is unsure. So he comes to Jesus for help in understanding this mysterious kingdom of Jesus that he's been talking about. And he comes in from the dark seeking light. What do I have to do? How is this possible? And Jesus responds with these images. Rebirth and spirit and wind. You want to get into the kingdom of heaven, Nicodemus? It's easy. All you have to do is be born from above. Oh my God, goodness, did that rattle his cage? Now in fairness to Nicodemus, we have a little problem with this translation. The Hebrew word for again and from above sound pretty similar. So we have brothers and sisters in other denominations who talk about being born again. It's actually not the most accurate translation. It's actually being born from above. But he gets into this discussion with Jesus. Well, how, how can I be born again? I can't go back into the womb. Is this some roundabout way of saying that it's impossible, there's no hope for an old codger like me, that there's too much water that's passed under the bridge? No, no, Jesus says. I didn't say born again. I said born from above. If you want to get to heaven, you have to be born from above, from the Spirit. And that's a gift given by God. It's not something we do. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can work towards. There's no set of rules. There's no formula that's going to get you there. It's God-driven, and God does it. Jesus said, flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit. What God wants to do with us is a renovation from top to the bottom. You must be born from above. And by the way, the you here is plural. So what Jesus is literally saying is, y'all must be born from above. He was from Southern Galilee, by the way. So y'all know what it's like to come here on one of those Sundays when you didn't really want to be here. When your mind is somewhere else. And to be honest about it, maybe your heart is somewhere else too. And then during the worship service or one of the hymns or the prayers or the communion or even the sermon of all things, something gets a hold of you. Some mysterious force somehow lifts that burden from your shoulders or helps you understand something that had been puzzling you. And you leave with your step a little lighter than when you walked in. Now what was that? What brought that about? Mysterious, amazing grace. For God so loved the world. The world. Amen.
Please rise as you are able as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. O oh God, you so love your church. Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians, seminary and college professors, and all who are called to the ministry of teaching. That they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Merciful God. O oh God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and inspire us to care for the natural world. Merciful God. O God, you so love the world. Uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression. Strengthen organizations that promote peace and harmony. Direct their work to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. Merciful God. O God, you so love your people. Draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, or addiction. Accompany them in their healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those who look to you in their time of distress, especially Jim and Tom, Donna, Juliana, David, Ryan, Pastor Sarah, Pastor Hank, Amy, Van, St. Paul Blissfield, Emmanuel North Blissfield, Pastor Rick Hogan, the family of Carol Miller, our confirmation class, Aubrey, Braden, Carson, Claire, Juliet, Michael, and Lamar, all those struggling with COVID-19 all over the world, the people of Ukraine and those in Turkey and Syria impacted by the earthquakes, and those still recovering from power outages and storm damage. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your children. Bless the young in our midst and our families. Delight us with their joy and wonder and curiosity. Revive our ministries with children and youth and equip us for faithful discipleship. Merciful God. O God, you so love your saints. As our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing to those who come after us. Merciful God. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share a sign of the peace.
Congregation, please rise as you're able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We feast on God's meal of love for us together. You may be seated.
Please rise. Let us pray. Embody God at your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. And may God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>